but I, I I do love the the Christmas time of year, and so we were we were thinking about what to talk about today, and we just thought, you know, let's talk about let's talk about Christmas. Let's talk about uh, the incarnation. Um, you know, at Christmas we we focus on Jesus being born, uh, and of course that's that's really a a focus on uh, who Jesus is. You know, and I, I think a lot of times. Uh, we we start thinking about, you know, the important thing about Jesus is is what he did, and but Christmas for for me anyway reminds me that uh, when we speak of Christianity, when we speak of the of the gospel, you know, we we not only need to understand what Jesus did, but we need to understand uh, who he was, and and I think that's where the the incarnation is is so important, you know, and you, I mean you start wrapping your mind around you know, Jesus being born in a, in a stable, lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. And, and here you have, you know, God in flesh and, and the meaning of, of that uh, and how that all worked out. It, it gets a little bit, it gets a little bit heavy. And uh, so we're going to, we're just going to take a, a few minutes today and, and examine the the doctrine of, of the incarnation. So that's kind of a big, big word, John, uh, incarnation. What is, what do we mean? Well, we're talking about in the flesh, Jesus, uh, the eternal son of God left the glories of heaven and took added to himself, added to his person. He's a, Jesus is one divine person. He had a divine nature, came to the earth and added to himself a human nature fully human, a body, a soul, all that goes along with being human. He added that nature to himself. Right. And you, and you mentioned um, who he is, and that is, uh, that is what we're talking about today. But it, is also, it also links to what he, did, what he d- did, because if Jesus didn't become flesh, didn't take on our flesh, he doesn't save us. So it, it does affect the work of Christ too. Absolutely. Right. The the purpose of him coming in flesh was to save the elect. Yeah. So yeah, those those two things are 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 very much uh linked. Um let's just kinda let's just kinda go back and, and start at the beginning. You you brought up some some things there that I was tempted to kind of <laughs> go go sooner f- further on in our conversation because we want to talk about some some errors, you know, and you, you mentioned that Jesus added on to, to who he was. And I, and I think that really will kind of hang on to that because there's some, there's some errors in the, in the church that kind of talk about that, but we'll, we'll get there. Uh, so let's talk about the, uh, the, the virgin birth, the, the, the manner that, that Jesus took on flesh. Uh, what is so, I mean, obviously the, the virgin birth is, is unique uh, to the to the Christian faith, uh, why is the virgin birth so important? I mean, we see those on the the liberal side. Uh, you know, they uh, argue against it. They they say things like, uh, she, "She was just un," um, you know, "She was just an unmarried woman or a young maiden. She wasn't necessarily, you know, a virgin. It didn't have a, a human father." So, why is it so important that we? that we back up and say, well, wait a minute. Uh, you know, she, she was a, a virgin. Well, I think the Bible makes it clear that she was a virgin. Um, it, to make the gospel work, we've got to get the incarnation right. And if Jesus, Jesus had to be God and he had to be man, if the gospel is going to work. So uh, he couldn't just be born from some dude named Larry, you know, and he's a really good guy or, you know, he had to be, he was the eternal son of God. And, and yet how is the eternal son of God going to be born in a virgin? Well, she has to be a virgin. She has to be pure. She, uh, the Holy spirit comes along and he allows her to conceive he brings about a supernatural conception in this virgin woman. 
And again, the Bible makes it clear that she's a virgin. Um, Isaiah, the Gospels, I believe, make it clear as well. Um, so, so what we believe is that the Holy Spirit taking the substance of Mary, because uh, Mary said uh, it's the fruit of uh, the woman, right? It's in, in uh, I believe it's uh, Luke one forty two. And she exclaimed with a loud, blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Mm -hmm. The baby is the fruit of Mary's womb. He is born of Mary's substance and yet conceived by the Holy Spirit. And so what you end up having is this Jesus takes on the human nature. He gets his substance, his body, his human body, soul, his humanity from, from Mary. And yet he's kept pure and from sin by the Holy Spirit. And, um, that's a critical for the gospel. Yeah, absolutely. And there was, there was other important figures in scripture, right. That, um, that the, the conceptions were, uh, miraculous, right. You, you have older people who, who were barren, they, they could not conceive, uh, but yet the Lord allowed them to conceive, you know, those, those yep. situations were, were different because there, there, there actually was a human father. The Lord uh, got involved. Those were miraculous instances, but not like this, you know? So I think when, yep. uh, and you reference this Isaiah seven fourteen, you know, that the Lord himself will give you a, a sign, behold, a virgin shall conceive and, and bear a son and you should call his name uh, Emmanuel, you know? So, you know, here's something distinct. It, it's different. You know, there is this, yep this woman who does not have a, a human father who by the power of the Holy spirit can conceived in and bore a son. And, and he is, um, he is God with us. Uh, he is God uh, in, in flesh. So, yeah, I think, I think you're exactly, I think you're exactly right there. Um, So when we talk about the the incarnation and we think of Philippians 2, um, Philippians 2 talks about, um, uh, Jesus being in, in the form of God and not count equality with God, something to be grasped, but emptied himself taking, the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. Uh, some people do some, some pretty strange things with that text. Uh, you know, like that phrase emptied himself. Uh, and, and here's where, where you kind of said earlier that, that he took on, uh, he took on to himself uh, another nature but what did he empty himself of? How do we understand that kenosis, kenosis, you know, idea? Well, it's kind of subtract. It's more subtraction by addition. I think that's the best way to understand that. Um, so the eternal son of God comes in his state of humiliation. In other words, he's going to become, he's going to enter into the flesh. He's going to, the incarnation, he's going to uh, add to himself a human nature. And then he's going to live, as the God man. And that is going to bring limitations upon him. At least he's, he's got to live. He's one divine person with two natures. He's got to live in this human nature within the, as well. And so he, he knows what it is to hunger, uh, to thirst, to grow in wisdom. He, he knows what it means to not know the future. No one, he said, no, at one point, no one knows the, the day the, except the father. Mm -hmm. He knows everything that we know. So he has these human experiences. And so I think it's the best way to talk about it is uh, a, a, just by a, a subtraction, emptied by subtraction. Or, yeah, excuse me, what did I say earlier? <laughs> My mind went blank. Addition by subtraction. Addition by subtraction. Yeah, yeah there you go. No, I, I, I like that. I like the way that you worded that. I, I think where we cross a line there, though, is we try to oversimplify this and, and say that, well, Jesus, 
he he took on you know this he's God, but he took on humanity. So he he gave up his his divine attributes. He gave up you know who he was to become a, a man. And it almost I mean, if you just take you know he emptied himself, taking on the the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in, in human form, humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death. You know I can I can see how you just take in some of that. Let me just uh, let me just. We're, we kind of haven't really got into the the whole error thing yet, but maybe we'll just kind of get there when we're talking about this. Because there's a there's a theory it's called kenosis theory that is kind of a it's kind of a doctrine that's running rampant in in some uh, parts of the the church, where where basically, um, and I'll just let this this popular pastor kind of just de- de- uh, describe this. Uh, you'll you'll know who it is probably when I hopefully it works here. Jesus made this scary statement. He said, the son of man can do nothing of himself. Do you know that Jesus so restricted his function on earth that he actually couldn't heal anyone? He couldn't multiply food. He couldn't cast out devils. He couldn't do any of that stuff because he had restricted himself to the life of a human being that would have to be dependent on the Father through the Holy Spirit. Now, if he did miracles as God, I'm still impressed, but I'm reduced to an observer. I stand back and go, that's amazing. God, that's amazing. But the New Testament was different. The New Testament shifted where everyone gets to be involved in that which God is doing. Everyone gets to be involved. Why? Because now the Holy Spirit that once rested on the prophets of old now dwells in every believer and he is the spirit of resurrection. The Holy Spirit is in you and he wants out. He's in us according to scripture as a river, not a lake. It's not just an abiding presence. It's a flowing presence that alters the geography of the world around us. It's being a people that learn how to cooperate with this wonderful Holy Spirit so that he can bring transformation to an individual, to an environment, to a city, to a nation. But he is the one who brings about the change. And it's my yieldedness to him that makes the difference. Never turn down an opportunity to die. Resurrection follows death. It doesn't precede it. It's yielding to the purposes of God. It's saying that yes in our heart of hearts that lives with the kind of risk that demonstrates faith. So, I mean, what he's what he's saying there is that God gave up his his divine attributes. He's not doing those those miracles as God, but he's doing them as as one that that places his his faith and, and trust in God through the Holy Spirit, just like we do. Um, yeah, I mean that's heretical. I mean, right. it's, it's not accurate. Yeah, in, in, in another place, uh, Bill Johnson says that while well, he's one hundred percent God, he chose to live with the same limitations that man would face once he is redeemed. He made that point over and over again. Jesus became the the model for all who would embrace the invitation to invade the impossible in His name. He performed miracles, wonders, signs in a right relationship with in right relationship to God, not as God. He performed miracles because he was. Um, if he performed miracles because he was God, then they would be unattainable for us. But if he did them as a man, then I'm responsible to pursue his lifestyle. Um, yeah, Hebrews says he emptied himself by by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man. That's how he emptied himself. So we've got to let Scripture determine what 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 we mean by that. And it doesn't mean all that stuff that he said. It just means basically um, subtraction by addition. It means 
by taking on the, the form of a servant, by becoming in the likeness of men, he emptied himself. That's what it says. That's what tech, that all the text is the point the text is making there. Right. Yeah. He he left his his position of of, of glory and became uh, and took on on human nature and therefore, um, you know, he emptied himself of that situation. So he he took on more. Yeah. I like I like that emptied uh, addition by subtraction. I think that's a good. I think uh, I got maybe from maybe I think a scroll maybe many years ago. So I want to give credit. Was okay. <laughs> I've never had too many original thoughts, Cole. You know that. That's right. That's yeah. Neither neither do I. Uh, so so we've talked a little bit about, and I, I mean we're just touching the surface here. We're trying to keep our our episode to, to about a half an hour, but um, so we've we talked a little bit about. Uh, the the manner of the incarnation, the virgin birth, why that was important. Uh, what about you know? And then we touched on the the purpose of it as well. So the the purpose of the incarnation was to to save the the elect. Um, how does the how does the incarnation fit into redemptive history? Uh, well, um, first of all. As you said, there was a. There, you're referring to by saying the elect. There was a plan before the foundation of the world, in which the Father would send the Son, and then this, uh, to redeem a people for Himself, the elect, as you said, uh, and the Spirit would apply that salvation to them. And so there was a plan before the foundation of the world, and then we come as we start to unfold uh, the Bible and read our Bible. We get to Genesis three after the fall. We get this promise in Genesis 3.15 that there will come a seed of the woman who will bruise the head of the serpent. He will deliver a head uh, a, a, a head crushing blow to the serpent, and it's the, from the seed of the woman. So again, there, there's another indication that this, this Redeemer, this Messiah, will be human and um, be from the seed of the woman. So that, I guess... Is that what you're looking for? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that really this is a, the, the, the virgin birth. I mean, even the, the Isaiah passage that we, that we referenced earlier, you know, is, is continuing this, this promise of Genesis three fifteen where God's going to unfold this, that, that one day uh, there will be one that will come to, to crush the, the head of the serpent and deal with the, the curse of sin and death once and for all. And you will know this sign that, that this one will come uh, because he will be born of a virgin. So, uh, you know, he's not just, a an example for us to follow in, in faith and do miracles like he did because he had this astronomical faith in God, uh, as, as Bill Johnson seemed to, to imply there. Uh, but, but he came in order to, to redeem us of the, from the, the curse of sin and death. And he came to, to save those who are his to seek and save those who were lost. Uh, it was, a it was a great rescue mission, right? I mean, yeah, but but it was all, it wasn't haphazard. It was all part of God's uh, divine plan. And I think even scripture talks about how when the fullness of time come, had come, you know, this, you know, this happened right when God wanted it and designed it to happen, that Jesus Christ would, would come, he would be born, he would live a, a perfect life for you and I, and then he would, he would die and, and pay the price that, that you and I deserve to, to pay. Um, so that all those who, who would place their, their faith and trust in him would have life in his name. Um, That's right. And, you know, um, to miss this, this doctrine to the incarnation, um, well, it, the church has always, always thought the incarnation was critical to the Christian faith. For example, example the Athanasian Creed, this is in the early church, said it is necessary to everlasting salvation that we also believe rightly the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is a very early creed in the, in the early church about uh, uh, referencing here the, the incarnation and that it's necessary to believe this for salvation. Um, the Belgic Confession also uh, from the, the Reformation era, uh, um, it says this, because there was a heresy of the day, a, a form of docetism, now that's a big word, I know. Docetism simply means uh, uh, a belief that 
Jesus is fully God, but he only appeared to be human. In other words, Jesus did not really take true humanity to himself. And so there is this, uh, some Anabaptists were teaching a celestial flesh doctrine. And in other words, whatever humanity that we speak of that Jesus got, it came from heaven. It didn't come from Mary. Mary was just like a, a tube he was squirted from heaven into the world through. And that is just uh, heretical. It's docetism in a, in, a, in, a, in a form of docetism. The word docetism is, comes from the word uh, here in the Greek. And here's what the Belgic Confession says about it. Our salvation and resurrection also depend on the, the reality of the body. And it, they also say in the, in the Belgic that contrary to the heresy of the Anabaptists, who deny that Christ assumed human flesh from his mother. So this is uh, from the early church through the Reformation area to, to our discussion here on this podcast today. This has always been looked at as a very serious thing to go wrong on the incarnation. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so you're kind of talking about the, the nature of the, the, the nature of it. And we call that the, the hypostatic union, how these two, you know, how these two natures, you know, fit together. And I think that um, that's kind of, that gets into a, a little bit of a, a complex subject, but, you know, there was, there were so many people that, that came along and tried to say, okay, how does, how does, how does Jesus's relationship to the father work? Um, you know, well, Actually, you know, Jesus was this this great being, but he, you know, to make it work, he only appeared to be he only appeared to be human, but was was actually God. Or uh, like the Arians, right in the the fourth century, they they said, well, Jesus is the you know the the first uh, created being, uh, and and they and they got that from uh, some of the the wording in, in scripture, and you know, the firstborn of all creation. Uh, how Paul puts that in in Colossians, you know. So they they made this this teaching from it that ended up dividing the the empire at the time, you know. So those those questions. In fact, uh, Jesus, you know, made this in in Matthew sixteen thirteen. Um, he asked his, his disciples, "Well, who who do you say that I am?" And that that question has been so profound, like you said throughout the the centuries all the way up until you know our conversation right now of all these people trying to to come alongside and say okay um you know who is who's jesus uh how does how does this work this this god in flesh and i think even uh you know bill johnson there's trying to you know come to to a conclusion on on that how do, how does this work why did jesus take on on flesh and what does that mean for the you know the god part and in and of course he jumps off a cliff when he says he gave up his divine attributes. Um, so, you know, we, so we have to affirm, we can't affirm like, uh, who is it? The, the Nestorians, you know, said that his, his humanity was in, in, engulfed in his, in his deity. It was like a, a drop of, of water in, a, in an ocean, you know? So here you have this almost like this, this superhero uh, picture who, yeah, he, he's human, but it's it just his, his humanity is so engulfed in, in, in his divine nature, uh, that it, that all you see is, is divine. When, when you look at him, you don't see as he's human. And you are so right when you said at the, at the beginning that, you know, when the, the virgin birth here is so important because, you know, he, he is, he has to be, you know, God on, on one side, he has to be a hundred percent human, uh, in order to, uh, to deal with, to deal with our sin, to, to be a, a sacrifice to, to die for us. So uh, there, there's some things here that we need to, we need to get right when it comes to. Yeah. It, um, a couple of just points. Yeah. Jesus had to be God. If the atonement was going to have an infinite um, quality to it, an efficacy to it, an infinite efficacy to it. How, how is that a, going to apply to save a multitude of people how is that it well because the divinity of jesus christ gives an infinite 
quality to it or aspect to it or efficacy to it. Mm -hmm. But he has to be a man. He has to be fully man to identify with us as our representative. Remember, because Adam was our first representative, there had to be another representative come who was of us, who was of our flesh. He had to be a man and he represents us as the God man. And he lived the perfect life for us. And the sin is punished on our humanity in Christ as our representative. So if Jesus is not a man, he isn't representing us. And his death in our uh, in our place, taking our sins, being punished in our place, isn't going to work if he's not a human. So uh, both the, the divinity and humanity are critical for the gospel. And I, and I think, you know, too, that one of the, the tendencies for, for people when they start thinking about, you know, God and, and man take together in, in one is, is to confuse uh, the, the two natures. Kind of like if you were taking, um, you know, two primary colors and, and mixing them, you, you get a different, you get a different color, you know. So, you know, Jesus is this, you know, that you, you take, you know, God up here and then man down here and you mix them together and you become, you know, you get purple, you get Jesus, you know, and yeah. uh, that that's not that's not a, a good way to describe who Jesus is. Um, yeah. Jesus is one divine person, one eternal divine person. There's only one person yet. He has two distinct natures. And um, how does God do all that? I don't know, but he, he has yeah. Yeah. the mystery, the miracle of the incarnation. Right. I think, uh, you know, we've kind of talked about it without, without confusion, without change, uh, you know, the God taking on human flesh didn't, didn't change who God is. Uh, you can't, um, you can't, div- you know, there was no division. It didn't divide, uh, the divine person. Right. Um, you know, there was no, there was no separation there. So, um, yeah, you don't have two personalities. You have one Jesus. Right. Yep, with two distinct so, natures. Yeah, and and like you said, I mean that gets a little bit. It gets a little bit confusing when you start trying to wrap your head around it. But yet, yeah, that's a, that's what we affirm when it comes to to who Jesus is, and that's kind of what the Orthodox position has been for for a long time. So, yeah, and it, you know the the problem. You know, is this really that big a deal? Well. Paul understood that there were other views of Jesus. In fact, matter of fact, in in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, he says this, For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit. Paul understood that there are competing gospels. There are <coughs> competing views of Jesus, even in the early church. As he's writing to churches, as he's planning churches, there's false views of Jesus and his work running around. And we have to get this right because ultimately, John, the Apostle John, puts it, I think, clearer than anybody in Second John. Second John, this is what he says. Verse 7, he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh hmm. incarnation. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Whoa. These hmm. people that just don't believe Jesus was fully man, truly man or antichrist. Yeah. That's exactly what John is saying. Watch yourself so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God does not have God. It is possible to be religious, talk about Jesus, have banners of Jesus in your home, in your church. If you get the teaching of Jesus wrong, as, as it's revealed in the scriptures, John tells us we don't have God, God and we're antichrist. So this is very serious. Yeah. Yeah. Did we switch around or is that my? Yeah. 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 I think, okay. I think we did. Wow. Yeah. Just, so, I, it's kind of weird. Keep, yeah. keep me on my toes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, that's that's good. Um, you think of anything else, John, that we need to 
mention here. Yep. Well, appreciate appreciate you guys uh, listening. Uh, this has been good for us to, to come back and, and think through some of these things and, and talk about them together. So edifying for us and hopefully uh, beneficial for you as well. So uh, next time we're going to get back into the London Baptist Confession and the 1689 and talk about uh, Sabbath, I believe. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that discussion. I think that's going to be a, that's going to be a good one. So Merry Christmas. So, yep. Merry Christmas. See you. See you next time.